Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. All right, guys. Welcome back to the Made It podcast. We are back with Gil. Gil, good to see you. Tell me about your story. There's somebody you have to meet. It's a friend of mine. I've known him since he was like five years old. I, I am 20 years older, but he's basically this video producer who happens to bear a passing resemblance to what you think the kid from Home Alone would look like when he grew up. And anyways, he went on TikTok with this humorous idea that he goes like, wait a second, how come I'm not getting credit? I was in this movie. Okay. People <laughs> believed it and some didn't believe it. Some were in on the joke. Is that how he grew his, his followers? Was, his followers. Was saying he was McCalkin? I mean, he, he's also <laughs> very funny and talented and, and clever and so that was great a good start. video editor. But that built a whole business for him as an influencer. Okay. I think he'd be a great guest for you. But the interesting story about the social networks is how much it is random, whether or not you're successful or not. And you today you hit 100,000 subscribers. We hit 100,000, guys. Which is pretty good. <laughs> it happened. You know, um, pretty get, good, pretty good. We Talk get a to me little... when you get to 10 million, but pretty good. Okay, yeah. Um, it's like four months, million. five months, you know, the growth rate at this point. Two months. Yeah. No, I'm saying so four or five oh, months. Oh, yeah, yeah, four or five million. months. Oh, yeah, for sure. A lot of it is, you know, something, you hit something with the algorithm, they like you, you do something right. And most of the influencers that I work with or that I've spoken to, if you ask them what got you to this point, most of them have no idea. Do they shake their head and are like, I don't know. But a lot of people, they shot their shot and they did it enough and some people figure it out. The one thing is... I just posted and posted and posted and posted and posted. And everybody knows every aspect of my life. And so I, maybe there's some element of that. But the first time that we had Gil on, I really liked it because we were talking about hyper. We were talking about influencer marketing. We posted this thing talking about partnership deals and, and how to find the right influencer to kind of help scale and launch your brand. And then we also talked about what that exit process was like. And we, we hit on quite a few different things kind of back to back. And there's some of the videos that did pretty well. Has anything changed since the, the podcast came out? Not because people saw the podcast, but has anything changed in your life from a business standpoint? I think what I realized is that a lot of your success as an investor is finding really, really big businesses. It's really tempting to find great founders. And like they say early on, you're investing in the person. Yeah. But one thing that I never really thought about too much was how big can this business get? Like I was like, if I sell for hundred million, I'll be happy. What my new added focus since then is like, I want businesses that could be $10 billion, $100 billion. And those are really, really hard to find. But I'm getting a lot more picky and looking not just for a great founder, not just for great early signs of a business. I feel like I'm going the other way. I feel like I hear about these like companies that like, especially when I first got started, I'm like, I want the next big thing. There's this video of Alex Hermosi. He was talking about how if you don't want to make a billion dollars, if you're okay with the idea of a hundred million dollars or less, like you don't have to build the next vacuum cleaner to, to compete with Dyson. You don't have to make this new mesh network internet, right? You can like buy everyday businesses and figure out how to scale them and just block and tackle very, very well. And I like that idea. And I probably lean a little bit more towards that way where you're going for the mission. I really like it as a founder. What's happened to me as an investor, you know, I can't write, you know, $4 million checks into companies and own 20% of the company. So I end up writing, you know, smaller checks, $25,000, $50,000 checks, yeah. owning one or two points max. And then watching a company grow to 100 million and, and, and say, okay, I did really, really well here. But how am I really, really going to get to the point where like everyone is taken care of, everyone I ever want to take True. care of? And that's where those companies, like at this point, I've done about 25 investments. Four or five of them look like they could be really, really successful and do well, but they're going to be sub 1 billion or maybe just shy of 1 billion. Some of them will be two, 300 million. And when you own a small percentage, you end up not making enormous amounts of money. And if you want to get to the, that next level as an investor, you either have to write bigger checks or you have to make bets that end up being bigger. Very much leaning into the VC model of like finding those big swings and finding those big hits. But the fact that you found four or five is pretty good. What are the four or five? Or if you were to pull out one or two of the companies that you think- well, are, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but you know the ones that are doing really, really well in our portfolio, there's there's Bubble Skincare, there's uh, one called, which is a teenage skincare. We have Antelope Pets, which is a uh, better for you pet food. Okay. We have Goodles, which is the mac and cheese with uh, Gal Gadot. We have a Barcode, which is a company with Victor Wembanyama. All of those, I think, have a very, very good shot of being a very, very big exit in the CPG space, which still is like, you know, rarely, rarely do you see things that are much more than a billion. Most of the times they'll sell a hundred to between a hundred and a billion. Like, you see some big. examples like Prime, mm -hmm. like hit the market and you see them go up, but also seeing them be able to maintain their position in the market's very hard, I think, in that space. Like it's very hard to keep that 
a valuation north of a billion dollars. Yeah, because it, it, it really, one is you have to stay relevant. You know, it's not like SaaS where, okay, I've already installed you. You're in my system. It's very hard for me to switch around. It's okay. Well, you know, I liked uh, this brand of skincare when I was a teenager, but now I'm not a teenager anymore. So now I'm going to look at something else. Or Goodles is amazing, really tastes really, really well. But what if somebody comes up with something that also tastes really good and that, you know, we sell Goodles at these retailers and this other retailer wants to get their own brand. So there's a lot of threats in the consumer space. That's why often you'll see these companies sell really early and never hit the really, really big valuations. Prime is really an exception. You know, there's not a lot of other examples where you see such meteoric growth. So the four I mentioned, I think, have a shot at being north of a billion. But most of the companies that we've invested, the ones that haven't gone under, end up finding a buyer anywhere between 50 million and you know, 200 million. Because that's where these companies start worrying about. Others are looking at them saying, okay, the market's, I can do this. I can make uh, better for you this, or I can make a better for you that. And they start imitating and doing and, and crowding the market and being more and more competitive, creating the environment that's more and more competitive. Are you focusing almost exclusively right now on consumer goods or are you also looking at SaaS and services and tech? I only do consumer stuff. I do consumer tech and consumer goods. The reason is because I can bring value to those uh, right. businesses. In consumer goods, I can get them into retail and get them a celebrity. In consumer tech, I, I know how to market it, but it's more kind of like fishing where I know how to fish. That makes a lot of then sense. Then is that really the best place to invest? Like I wish I could tell you that I am an expert at rockets and you know I can invest in that space or I could get into the first round of Anthropic because everybody wants my opinion. Have you talk to other founders to like co-invest and build syndicate deals? And if so, how do you go about doing that? I have a group of people that have either invested or not invested. If they haven't invested, it's the, the pitch is, remember how you didn't invest in Bubble or in Google? And you missed out. And, and you missed out? Well, I'm doing the same thing over here. For the ones that have done well, typically we try, we, we tell nobody, don't ever invest in one company. Like you need a portfolio. You can be the, the best VCs in the world miss. So um, hopefully they've had some wins. And then it's pretty easy to get them to want to roll the dice again. Have you thought about structuring a fund or, or, or is that what you've done with Stardust? At the time when we thought about the idea, we, we wanted to start a fund. We partnered with a basketball player named Kyrie Irving. That didn't really lead to us to where we wanted to go. And he kind of, at some point, it wasn't a good fit for him. So he just decided he didn't want to do it. And then we decided not to raise the fund. We just started investing our own capital. A lot of things happened. You know, COVID hit, the markets, people were talking about this bubble bursting. So money wasn't available as much. If I were to start a fund, it would only be once I knew that I had a significant amount of money committed. I don't want to run a $5 million fund. I'd rather just fund it and do SPVs. Hey, podcast listeners. This is Nate from the Made It Podcast. Wanted to reach out to any uh, founders, growth marketers, sales leaders listening. We've made a community just for you, and we wanted to invite you to join. We have growth playbooks for you to use, instructional events a few dozen every month to learn how to use the latest technology, uh, even some free services that can be helpful to help your company grow. The first thousand people to join are free. We've created a link. You can click on it in the bio for this episode. We hope you join us over our community. I mean, at a certain point, you need a size, right? And like 50 million, probably minimum for it to make sense, hundreds of millions for it to actually be, for the carry to be very meaningful for you and to support a staff. The way we do our business is we, we go, we set up these SPVs, we invest in the companies, but we also work for them. For the first three to six months, we go get them celebrities and influencers and help and get them into retailers, kind of like an accelerator, we take something for that. But that part doesn't scale. So if I invest $50,000 and I get $50,000 worth of for my services, okay, now it's like I invested $100,000. But I invest $4 million and I get $50,000 for my services, doesn't really scale. So our model doesn't really work well as a fund, though we're trying to figure it out. I think it could be nice. And every once in a while, somebody with a lot of capital will say, hey, we should start a fund like this. But none of that has ever really materialized. If you were to pick a consumer product brand that you would like to work with and just like shout it out into either, who would that be? If you're watching this and you have this product, I will raise you as much money as you want. I want cream that actually works that you could put on your hair if you're bald, and your head if you're bald and it grows hair. I will put that shit on the rock and he will grow his hair and everybody will make billions. Okay. So if you have that, that's the brand I want. Has a rock reached out to you and said, I need this? He has this. not. Uh, uh, only while well, I manifest, but not really. Um, hair growth is like a big thing now. They have these hair treatment works. centers now yeah, everywhere. Typically, like it works if you're balding, but not if you're already bald. Right. The first thing you would say is like, this, this doesn't work. Like there's no way it works. Right. But then I put it on the rock and he shows up with 
an afro like a month later and you see it every day growing, I would make billions. Like that's what I want. Gil, I kid you not. I like, I think that there is like a article or something I read like three months ago talking about this advancement and like regenerating like hair follicles. I, I swear so, I saw something about so this. I think there are three big revolutions that we're going to see in the next few years and it's right. not self-driving cars. I mean, it's tied to AI. This is more right. important than that. Yeah. It's going to be AI. <laughs> it's going to be weight loss medication. Yeah. And it's going to be something that grows hair back because as someone who's that's always on his mind. Like I, I know a lot of people who that's always on their mind and would pay a lot of money to, to resolve it. So for sure. I mean, you saw hymns and they're billion dollar companies. Like they're really, really big and they're just finasteride, minoxidil combination. Right. And they, and they just sell other people's products. Right. But the, the guys who make a lot of money are the guys who own, think about the guys who own the GLP one drugs. Those companies have become the biggest companies in the world. And, you know, HIMSS is one example, but everybody's going to be selling it. And I think there's 6 million Americans using GLP-1 drugs today, but there's three out of four Americans are overweight. 40% of Americans are obese. The cost of, of people being overweight on the medical system, the impact that it has on fast food, the impact that it has on, you know, United Airlines, I think, said that an average flight's going to weigh 8,000 pounds less. All those things are really, really, the, the foundations of really, really big companies. So I'm not saying hair loss is as big, but I could make a lot of money. A lot it's, money. it's a big deal. So yeah, I 100% agree. Hair loss, if you have a secret pill, gel, cream, mm -hmm. we, we want it. So that's that's one that you want to just manifest yeah. out of thin air. Do you have any other ones that you want to so manifest? This one, I don't think it's a good investment, but I would love to do is take over a dating app and okay. rethink the whole thing. But one, not one where I have to acquire all the customers, one that already has a customer base. What's your pitch? What's your, what's your so skill? My, my, I, I think dating apps are broken as a business today, and that's why I wouldn't invest in one, so don't pitch me any. But in general, the problem with that business is that their success is their failure, right? If you're on a dating app and you match with someone, it's a really good match, then you're not going to use it anymore. So your goal is to make sure that they never find love. No, my goal is <laughs> to figure out a way to make the experience so that People on the app are really, really looking for a relationship, but also want to stay on the app because then the relationship is kind of like a SaaS business. So are you providing like marriage training? Or no, I mean, what marriage is like a long way to do it. But what I am doing is one is I'm disincentivizing the bad behavior. And again, I'm not saying this is a good business, but this is a good way to build the app, I think. Disincentivizing the bad behavior. Right now, I think I read 70% of users on the apps are not really single. Or they're just people checking their options or just making sure, or not really in the market to find someone. Not good. Yeah. Be with your boo. I think what happens though is like, you kind of get in this groove where like, you're either not matching at all. You know, if you're like in the, in the if you're not in the most attractive or don't really know how to sell yourself, you're not treating yourself as a product. And yeah. the apps are in the business of just making you feel like there's an endless amount of options because that's their, their business to retain you as a customer. You want to encourage good behavior. How, how are you doing that? I would start creating intentional friction in the app. So right now you basically go on, you swipe as much as you want right. and there's no repercussion to dating eight people at once. So I would build in mechanisms that one, encourage you to slow down and really, really be picky about who you approve, but when you approve, okay. you really want to. And two is discourage you from matching and not meeting. Because I think the, the biggest thing that happens on the app is that- Ghosting. Right, but what we saw was this guy did this thing on YouTube. So we swiped right on 4,000 women, of which about 200 swiped right back, if I get numbers correctly. And then he wrote them and then like 40 responded. And then of the 40, I think five spoke to him on the phone and three went on a date and none of those led anywhere. And so the numbers are really, really bad. And like, when I look at that, I think of a funnel, like you've done marketing funnels, right? Yeah. Just like, let me optimize every single one of these steps with the focus of, I want to get to the point where if you're genuinely looking, you're going to come out with a match. And the truth is most people don't come out with real matches. For Gil, hear me out. Arranged marriages. I don't know what to say. I'm Jewish. I come from the Jewish community. Matchmaking is a very, very big thing. There's this app called Loop that actually caught on fire in our, in the Jewish community. So you go on, you upload, and then you have to like kind of be nice to the matchmakers there and they go and look for people for you. Yeah. And like the one I spoke to, which I never thought I'd use a matchmaker, but the one I spoke to literally called me on the phone and spoke to me for half an hour to make sure that I'm serious. He's like, I'm going to, I'm giving you prime, you know, best eligible bachelorettes yeah. here. Like you need to be serious about this. And not only that, but if like, are you going to pay, are you, she literally asked me, he's like, are you going to pay for the day? And I was like, of course I am. She's like, you'd be surprised how many people, how many guys don't want to pay for the day. And, and she's like, the, the women that I'm asking them difficult questions too, because I want to make sure that you treat each other properly. And by the way, she texted me after to see how the date was. So now I have accountability. 
I liked what you were saying around like adding friction to something that probably needs friction. I think that's pretty important. If you make it too easy to go on these dating apps and swipe right and left, like this is for something that is a very serious commitment thing, it's not conducive to a good long-term relationship. So I could see that. I thought you were going in a different direction when you were talking about how it's like a one-time thing in regards to like you go into the app, you find love, game over, no more app. I thought you were talking about what is the next stage beyond that? But for me, I was married for many years, recently got divorced yeah. and suddenly back in the game and like look as a, as a married guy looking at the outside, I was like, these apps, oh my God, it's magic. Then you get to it and you're like, I hate this. Like it's, I'm, I'm matching with people. I'm wasting my time. The question is like, okay, you've had the first date now. Sometimes you you're, you had the magical date and you're like, this is the best thing ever. Of course, we're going to be together forever. Yeah. But most of the time, you kind of don't know what's next. You know, as a guy, you're like, did she like me? Did she not like me? Should I call her? Should I call the next day? So suddenly you have this whole support system, right? One is she's talking to the matchmaker, you're talking to the matchmaker. So I'm not saying my app would do that, but I think they, they're on to something. It's a space I'm always intrigued by. I've never, I've seen so many things. I've never been tempted to actually invest in it because of that problem of success means failure. Yeah. Um, and like think about almost any other business, like you, you work so hard to acquire a customer just to send them on their way. It's, it's, you know, so it's always been for me a space that I was like, no. If you look at Bumble, right? So you have Whitney Wolf and, and she did like the, the women make the first move, mm -hmm. right? So that was the first thing, but now she's in business relationships and there's Bumble BFF, like mm -hmm. you can find a friend. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know anybody who uses that because it's so clumsy. Like, do I really want to find a friend on an app. I mean, it took years for people to be comfortable using dating apps. I remember nobody would admit that they ever met anyone on a dating app. Now everybody's on them. Men making friends after the age of 30, that's a miracle. Like, have you heard that oh, joke that like that Jesus's biggest miracle is that he had like 12, 12 friends that's great. after the age of 30? And, and you're like, oh, oh, oh yeah. That's amazing. But uh, think about Bumble, you know, so the idea that the women make the move first, they're changing that. Have you heard this? Yes. And, and the, it's because the a women deal. think it's too difficult to make the first move. Our generation and like my generation, like a younger generations, it's very different. Like I remember having to walk up, having to like literally get I the balls. that's good for you. Walk up after a woman, up to a woman and risk. It's never happened to me. Risk the idea of her being really, really mean to you. If they've said no, like 99 out of 100 times, but, how but they were very right? nice, right? But the one thing Bumble did was they kind of shifted the the onus to the women and suddenly you see that that doesn't work that way. Like women are complaining, nobody walks up to me, nobody, but you're not even sending a first message on the app. It's really difficult. Those are two good manifestations. So like in the future, better dating with hair. <laughs> That's... Not or a dating app for women who like men without hair. I could settle for that. If you if you have one of those, I'll sign up. Hi there, this is Nate Houghton with the Made It Podcast. Wanted to let you know that this episode is supported by Rush Imhotep. Rush is a financial advisor with Northwestern Mutual. He's one of our preferred advisors that we like to connect people with. Specializes in working uh, with individuals with non-traditional career paths like entrepreneurs. If you want to learn more or connect with Rush, you should go to wealthwithrush.com. The link is in the episode bio below. Check it out. Let us know what you think. We were talking previously about like you can start this venture studio and you can help spin up businesses. Do you ever think about starting a venture studio of your own? I have, but I'd like to do it when I feel like I have enough money to fund it myself as opposed to bring outside money. Sense. I think the biggest challenge with early stage businesses is the fear of pivoting and the fear of running out of money. When you're early stage, really early stage, and you raise a proper round, then people expect you to hit a milestone at the end of that round. And the truth is that most businesses don't do what they tell their investors are going to do. Right. You hit the market, you find out that way people don't want it this color or that color or this use case, and you learn something and then you go back and you, you reiterate and you reiterate and you reiterate, and then eventually you get there somewhere there. And some people get it on the second try and some people get it on the 12th try. So what I'd love to have is a venture studio that doesn't fund you in that way. It doesn't say, okay, here's $400,000, go build something. And if it works, great. And if not, you're out of money and go back. But instead says there are stages to the funding and you can do it. But I think that's very hard to do with other people's money. I have to give a shout out to Eric Bon. Have you heard about Hustle Fund? No. So he was on the podcast a few weeks ago and Eric um, started this thing called Hustle Fund, which is a community around fundraising. And what I like about what they do is they get this cohort of say like 20, 40 different companies and they pair you off with like mentors and advisors and the network. And, but they say like, this is the milestone. Like you don't have to get all the way to the finish line. You don't have to get X number of revenue or users, but we want to see you accomplish something. Right. And like, you're going to tell us what that something is. So that founder helps like 
kind of stick that flag in the ground oh. and say like, hey, we're going here. They follow up with them over three months. They give them resources and they see, is that milestone checked or not? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but then you narrow the field. And so they give you an initial round of funding. They see if you hit that milestone that you set for yourself and that they mm -hmm. agree with. And then they give you another tranche of funding. And then they open it up to this community of investors and entrepreneurs. And I thought it was a very logical. They probably do this, but I, I would think is like, there's also color to it because why didn't you hit it? Right. It's one thing I didn't hit it because the product I built is horrendous and I don't understand anything. It's another to say, look, we hit, we got near, but the flag moved because some competitor popped up or we didn't know that this guy, or we learned something about the market yeah. and now we're way closer to something. And maybe so, that's part of it yeah. is that they have to look holistically. Like, did they make a pivot for the right reason? And you can still see that performance. But I think what I like about this is that instead of doing a single point, which is what you do whenever you invest in someone, you're, you're taking them at that moment and you're looking at their data room and you're like, at this moment, yes or no, will I invest? I like that it's staged yeah. you get two points and you get to see a line of some type do you remember like many and it's not anymore but a while back there was this thing where like you have to fake it till you make it and like people believed it right and everybody would say it even the most well-known people in this space were like ah, you you have to fake it till you make it right and that what that in my opinion bred like all these founders that really really faked it because whenever you have the, the the people who fake it a little you're always going to have the people who like want to be six, even more successful and then you're on an island called fire fest and it's right. everyone's <laughs> there's no toilets fake it, but don't make it yeah. <laughs> I understand the logic behind it, but part of it is driven by this idea that you're always, as a founder, you're always on this like ticking time bomb yeah. of like money's going to run out. So I want to take that out of the equation and I want to say, look, we're a team, you know, this, our studio and you are a team and we're going to meet not quarterly and we're not going to just get reports. We're really going to know what's going on in this company. There's no like line that if you don't cross at this point, you're dead. It's more like continue building a story that we can all believe in. And pivoting is suddenly, it's not fake it till you make it, it's pivot till you make it. Because the real biggest reason for failure that I see with founders is running out of money. Yeah. Logically, that makes sense. No, but right. But for good founders, right. right? Of course, you have the really bad ones that would run out of as much money as you gave them. And it would never happen. They don't really have what it takes. But if you found a really, really good founder, the ones that I've invested in that haven't done well, I still think are really, really good founders. They just weren't that good at raising capital or they ran out of money or something in their market happened that yeah. required a lot more capital that they could raise. I mean, think about all the different stars that have to align as far as being in the right industry, being in the right market, having the right product or service, having the right founder, having the right team. That's another thing that hopefully the venture studio could help with, which is, okay, you recognize what you're really, really good at and let's surround you with the people that aren't. And I, yeah. I think, like, I don't think I was the world's greatest founder. I think I was like a B, B plus type founder. But the one thing I was really, really good at is recognizing what I don't like doing, what I'm not really good at, and right. finding someone good to do it. And probably me, myself, I probably would never gotten to the point where we sold the company. What are some of the things that you're looking forward to in this this next year? I'm really, really excited about the GLP-1 drugs in case that wasn't clear. So I have invested in a company in the space. I can't talk about too much. You have customers that will use this product probably for the rest of their lives. From a business perspective, it's selling a product to a that's recurring. high lifetime value that's recurring yeah. that they'll never stop. And that's really, really exciting especially because it's kind of a do-good product for these people that otherwise would have a shorter life, would have a less enjoyable life, would be less attractive on the dating apps, would feel less comfortable socially, would be funding these horrible, horrible um, obesity markets like McDonald's and like fast other fast food places. We have so much technology that we're not able to adapt our bodies fast enough. Like big chip companies are like, this is the chemical that's going to make them eat 20 bags of this stuff and it's going to be in every Lunchable and, and our bodies just weren't able to handle having access to so much sodium sugar. So we, and like, it's interesting that with science, we're able to counteract that. And the question is, can we counteract that fast enough? And then what is the paradigm shift like what's going to be the you know we were talking before we went on camera we talked about how i like to play civilization yeah and you mentioned you'd played it before and one of the things about the game is that at some point you know you research technologies as you move forward and at some point you get to the point where they just call it future technology yeah because they couldn't figure out what was happening yeah that's where we are yeah. in life now yeah. like we're at future technology like the stuff that the civ developers <laughs> i'm sorry i'm just imagining like you're like starting out in italy and then you're like
kind of the same way for a startup, which, you know, a lot of startups like have this really, really good idea to start with. So it's maybe like kind of like landing on a, an attractive plot of land at the beginning of the game. Yeah. And then you start exploring. But then what happens in those next 50 turns, who you recruit, you know, which units you build and those things, right. which land you target, what do you decide not to do? All those things really, really determine turns, you know, 51 to 400 till the end of the game. And the same thing with startups, like the ones that don't have a really, really fast start have to pivot and restart really, really quickly because I can't think of a lot of companies that have been around for four years and then suddenly blew up. It, I'm not saying it never happens, but if it's not happening really, really quickly, you have to figure out what's going wrong. I actually am pretty dead set on civilization being a business game. I'm pretty sure that there's a, like a lot of stuff there. I think that uh, like whenever I think about like how do you prepare for the future, how do you optimize all these different things 1% of the time, how do you capture opportunity costs because you have to allocate your resources somewhere. Other people, it's business is like a limitless game, right? Like the board continues endlessly and everyone's trying to take you out. So from a Civ perspective, there's only so many resources and everyone's trying to take you out. The skill set's very transferable, like a lot of it. And also like you could, everything looks great and then, and then somebody declares you. war. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, and that's the same thing and as you're the like, founder. Cool. You're like, wait, <laughs> Facebook's suing us? What's going on? <laughs> Why can't we all just be nice in our countries and like I'll have a good time together and we can trade. It'll be great. It's like uh, a ton once someone happen builds your right road. That'll after that drug, um, hair, hair growing drug that is. If we had, yeah. if we saw tear loss and if we had a better dating app, there will be oh, less geez. war. Gil, where should people go to find you? <laughs> I'm at uh, gil at stardustventures.us um, or on uh, LinkedIn, Gil AL. Well, cool. Thanks for being on the pod again. Thanks for having me. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.